Great. That would be perfectly okay. Yep. We are now live. All right. It's like setting up. But yeah, we usually like, that would be perfectly okay. We like give it like a few minutes, like so everyone can like hop on and stuff like that. Sure, yeah. But like I was looking at the Figs Instagram and they did they did a apology post. They like are donating like money to a Dio. Um, yeah, it's like a Dio. Um, I forgot what it's called. It's like an like AOA. Like, yeah, that one. But That's yeah, they're like donating. I think it's like a hundred grand, something oh, like that. That's decent. That's a good amount. <laughs> yeah. As they should, right? As yeah. they should. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. But yeah. I think we should go ahead and get started. Sure. Yeah. All right. Hi guys. Welcome back to Call Through Fall. Today we have Dr. Koma. She is a pulmonary and critical care um internal med physician, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on today. I think this is so great what you guys are doing, and it's definitely getting the word out there about medicine and allowing college students and pre-med students to get exposure as much as they can in the era of COVID. So this is awesome that you guys are doing it, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Um, like she said, I am a pulmonary and critical care physician, and I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit about my journey through medicine and how I kind of ended up where I am today. And we're going to go through a case study, um, something that I've been seeing a lot in our ICUs with the era of COVID. And I'll take any questions you guys have afterwards or even during it too. Yeah. So if you guys have any questions, just leave them in the chat and um, we'll get to them as, as we go. So if you want to start the screen share and get us started. Sure. All right, can you see it okay? Yep, that's perfect. All right, so um, like I said, we're just gonna kind of go into uh, my journey in medicine and then we're gonna go into the case study and I kind of split it up into two halves. So if you guys have any questions about my journey at the end, feel free to ask um, as well. So I graduated from college in 2008 and then I decided to get my master's in 2009, and I graduated from medical school in 2013 from Ross University. And if you're not familiar with that, it's actually a Caribbean medical school, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about as well. Um, I took one year off, and then I started residency in July of 2014, and I graduated residency in June of 2017, and then I started a pulmonary and critical care fellowship in about you know a day later in 2017 and then I graduated from my fellowship June 30th 2020 so it's been just a few months and I'm a brand new attending physician practicing on my own and kind of making it on my own now so um, I can't speak to too much about attending life because I just started but I can definitely answer any questions leading up to this point so if you guys have any just let me know so as I kind of went through my journey, you're probably wondering, why did she do her master's? Why did she go to Caribbean med school? Does it look bad if I go to a Caribbean med school? I'm going to discuss with you the pros and cons of that and kind of why I chose to do it this the way that I did it. And then why did I choose internal medicine and then go on to pursue a fellowship in pulmonary and critical care medicine? So just to give you all some statistics and background, and again, this is not to scare you, this is not to dissuade you from applying to medical school, but just to show you how competitive it is, as if you know you guys probably already know this, but um, they're getting harder each year. And the acceptance rate in 2018 was 6.8%, and the competitive Ivy League schools were at 2.4%. Average GPA for all US med schools was about 3.8, which has increased every single year. And the average MCAT score was 512. And a lot of the non-competitive medical schools have now become very competitive where we've seen a very large jump in MCAT scores compared to the previously known more competitive schools. So it's hard to get into medical school. That's the bottom line. And I took a risk going to a Caribbean medical school and 
I'm going to give you three pros and three cons. And I want you guys to think for yourselves, if you're thinking about going to a Caribbean medical school, kind of what is important to you and what you think would be the most beneficial for you in terms of what you want to do for your career and your life. We all know it's much easier to get accepted into a Caribbean medical school. Um, the average MCAT and GPA for matriculants at these schools are much lower. Um, they offer a second chance essentially to people that did not do great in college or didn't take it seriously or that studied really hard for the MCAT, didn't do well on it, they had to take it multiple times. Um, and if they don't really have a shot at an allopathic USMD or DO school, this is kind of a fallback. Um, the clinical rotations are in the United States. So if you are thinking about going to a medical school that's not in the USA, one piece of advice I can give you that's probably the most important piece of advice is you want to make sure that these schools are offering clinical rotations in the United States. So this means that your third and fourth year of medical school should be in the United States. If you are looking at schools that are foreign, that are not in the Caribbean and they're in some other country, if you are doing rotations that are not in the USA, your application will likely not be looked at until you get American clinical experience. And then it's um, also based on a rolling admissions process, the Caribbean medical schools. So it's a great option for people that are older or have certain life situations. For example, Ross Medical School, where I went, they offered rolling admission in September, January, and May. So for example, if you found out you didn't get into an American medical school in February, you could start med school in May at Ross. So it offered that flexibility. And if you were kind of pushing to get through med school, you, you're thinking to yourself, you know what, I just want to get this part of my life done. I'm going to go down this, this road. This is a good option for you. However, the cons, I think, are pretty big cons. And this is where the stigma of going to a Caribbean medical school comes into play. And I'm actually going to preface this by saying that I faced that stigma of being a Caribbean grad up until I became an attending. Um, so it's something that you definitely need to take into consideration if you're thinking about going to a Caribbean medical school. There's no guarantee that you're going to become a doctor. The statistics as of 2018 are that 50% of foreign medical school graduates matched into US residencies, whereas 94% of American med school graduates match into US residencies. So that is a huge discrepancy. And the other piece of information I want you all to look at is 50% of the foreign medical graduates that are graduating from medical school don't match into residency. That doesn't include the amount of people that started in a Caribbean medical school, but didn't make it because they failed or they decided it wasn't for them. So really the people starting at a Caribbean medical school and then ending up in residency is much, much lower than 50%. Um, and as you all know, there's very limited options for residency. Um, the competitive specialties are very hard to get into. If you're thinking to yourself that you wanna do neurosurgery, orthopedics, plastics, um, dermatology, any of those very competitive fields, maybe going to a Caribbean medical school is not something that you should consider because not only do you have to be top of your class in the Caribbean, you have to actually have higher scores than students from American medical schools do just to make yourself more competitive due to that stigma that's there. So if you wanna do something like primary care, pediatrics, internal medicine, family medicine, OB-GYN, um, you know, so even psychiatry, these are easier residencies to get into, not easy, they're easier. And that gives you more options if you choose to go to a Caribbean medical school. And then lastly, you know, the bottom line is that these schools are not always in it for the success of their students. One of the things that I noticed when I was in residency, um, it was attached to a medical school and the medical students there had so much access to mentorship, to resources, to extra help. And that was something that I really, really wished I had in medical school. But if you choose to go to a foreign medical school, especially a Caribbean medical school, that support system is not there. You almost have to form your own support system and have find your own resources. And it's just, it becomes a lot of competition among students. And it's a very, very difficult time in your life if you choose to go to a Caribbean medical school. And I just kind of wanted to put that out there if you are considering it. 
I chose to go to a Caribbean medical school because at the end of the day, I wanted to be a doctor. I was going to do whatever it took to be a doctor. If that meant that I can't see my family for four years, which thankfully that didn't happen, but I was going to do it. And I knew that I wanted to do something like internal medicine. I didn't want to do something super competitive like plastics or dermatology or anything like that. So I knew my chances of getting a residency was going to be higher than if I wanted to do something super competitive. So everyone's story is different. Everyone's journey is different. Don't compare yourself to others. If you do the research and you think that this is something that's going to work for you, then pursue it. But I think that the stigma there, while it's probably not warranted, some of it's actually true. And I just wanted to give you my my take on that. So there have been some questions on your yeah. journey. So someone said, um, what is the average GPA for um, a Caribbean med school? Like a average? So a lot of, so there's, so as there are American medical schools, there's different tiers, like there's easier medical schools to get into in America than others. It's actually like that in the Caribbean. So there's easier Caribbean medical schools to get into, and then there's harder Caribbean medical schools to get into. Ross was one of the harder ones. Um, I personally had um, a GPA of 3.6, graduating from the honors program at Chapel Hill. And I got into Ross um, without having done their introduction course. So people that don't have as good of GPAs, they make them do three months in, I think it's Miami or somewhere where they have to essentially take these pre-med classes, pass a test before they can even start medical school. That GPA to get into that was around 333. So the easier medical schools in the Caribbean, you could have failed college classes and still get into a Caribbean medical school. But The caveat with all of that is, are you serious about going to medical school? So did you just goof off in college and you really have that drive and that ambition? Then that may be something to consider. But did you unfortunately try in college? You didn't do well in those pre-med classes? And it may, you can try the Caribbean, but it may not be something that's for you. So that's something to keep in mind. So you can really just have any GPA to get into these Caribbean schools. Okay. Um, Just another one real quick before you move on. Um, Someone said, if you could go back, would you go to medical school in the Caribbean again, or would you try to go to medical school in the U.S.? So that is a very tough question, and I've often asked myself that. Um, Today, I would say yes. I would do this again because I if I was able to see into the future and know that I was going to have my dream job, Yes. But if you asked me this while I was going through the process, I probably would have said no. Because it is a lot of time away from your family and friends. It is a lot of sacrificing your social life. It's a lot of missed weddings, engagements, baby showers, you know, friends' birthdays, your own birthday. So knowing what I know now, I would do it. But the process while I was going through it, I would probably tell you don't do it. Okay. It's hard. I mean, you have to really, really want this. Right. So you can't sugarcoat that. You can't. <laughs> um, so just to kind of get into some of the competitiveness of internal medicine, it's kind of one of the least competitive specialties. Whereas on the left here, you can see germ surgery, ortho, neurosurgery, even psychiatry is becoming more competitive. Um, And at the bottom here, about 8,000 people match into internal medicine. So looking at the left-hand column, there's a lot less number of spots available in the USA compared to internal medicine, which is why internal medicine isn't as competitive. And if you do decide to specialize in internal medicine, the AMA actually has on their website that the three most popular positions Subspecialties of internal medicine are cardiology, cardiology, pulmonary and critical care, and hemoc. So if your decision to go to Caribbean medical school is because you think internal medicine is easier to get into, but then you decide later on that you want to specialize, just keep in mind that cardiology, pulmonary, and hemoc are the top three competitive specialties in internal medicine. So 
what a typical day is like at residency and fellowship. If you are on an inpatient month, it usually consists of the calendar month or 28 days. And the normal amount of days off is about four days. The shifts are 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And usually, you know, if you're starting out or you're in medical school, you get there at around six in the morning and you don't leave until after, after sign out, which is signing out to the night team, the patients that you have, and that's at around eight. A typical team is two interns, um, which are first year residents, and then a senior, which is a second or third year resident. And there's 20 patients total on the team. And the maximum number of patients that an intern can have is 10. That's an ACGME guideline. And then the fellow oversees the work of the seniors and I guess the interns too. And the attending oversees the work of everybody. So that's kind of how the hierarchy works. So from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., the intern, senior, and fellow, they review the charts, they see patients, and this is called pre-rounding. And then from 9 to 12, the attending fellow, interns, and senior, they round on all of the patients that are on their service. So if you're on internal medicine or ICU, surgery, however many patients are on your service, you're going to see and talk about all of them and discuss the plans for the day. Sometimes rounds are three hours, sometimes they're eight hours, sometimes they're one hour. It's very, very dependent on the attending and how functional the team is. And then afterwards, you're not in the clear. After you're done with rounds, you have to follow up on labs, you have to order more imaging based on the labs or based on what the patient's doing. Nurses are calling you for different questions, you're putting out fires, you're admitting new patients between all of that, you're discharging patients, you're writing scripts, between all of that, you have to write your notes from the rounds that you just did and then get lunch or water in between. Um, the attending is not usually present after rounds and a fellow, so a fellow is gonna be somebody that's in hemonc, GI, palm crit, any of the specialties of internal medicine. Um, they're gonna be around but not physically seen. And then the senior resident, if they're a good senior resident, they're sticking to the interns like blue all day and making sure that everything that the intern is doing is appropriate. So I'm gonna pause for a minute and talk about two books that I highly, highly recommend. I don't know if you guys have heard of any of these, um, but their first book is called The House of God. It's by Samuel Shem. He's a psychiatrist and it, this book is really old, but everything that he writes about is very, very pertinent to medicine today. And just the jokes he tells in the books, the different story situations, I found it very, very relatable. Um, and then the second book is by Dr. Odwish, and she's actually a pulmonary and critical care physician. And she wrote this book called In Shock, and it's about her experience as a patient in the ICU. And she talks kind of about the other side of things. So I thought that these books are very, very good. People that are interested in medicine and want to know more about it. So what is pulmonary and critical care? So pulmonary is a specialty of the lungs, and we deal with anything anything that has to do with breathing. So asthma, COPD, smokers, lung, lung cancers, interstitial lung diseases, which is diseases between the alveoli, cystic fibrosis, lung transplant, pneumonias, um, anything you can think of that have to do with breathing, we deal with. And then the other half of that is critical care. And these are managing patients in an intensive care unit. So there's lots of different types of intensive care units. There's neurocritical care, medical, um, surgical, trauma, NICU, you know, there's so many different critical care units, but we specifically deal with surgical, medical, and neuro. Those are our three um, under our umbrella. So these can be any surgical cases that went wrong or that were very in depth, or the surgeon was unable to extubate them, meaning take out the breathing tube after surgery, um, very sick medical patients, any patients that's on a ventilator and they need somebody to manage it. So this is the connection between pulmonary and critical care. It's that ventilator management. Um, patients that have cardiac arrests or code blues, bad infections, basically any organ system that is severely compromised and needs constant monitoring, we take care of in critical care. And this is why I chose it. I mean, I, I thought it was very mentally stimulating. It's procedural. And a lot of the pathophys that I learned in medical school, I actually apply on an everyday basis. Um, one of the things that I realized going through residency was why did I take OCHEM? Why did I take physics? Why did I take all of these classes? I don't even use any of it. But I actually do use a lot of the physiology, anatomy, the classes that we learn in medical school. I apply that every day to critical care. 
like the Krebs cycle, you should remember that because that is something that you will use for the rest of your life if you do critical care. And the hands-on procedures is what I really like. We put in central venous access, which is a line, it's basically a large IV that goes into one of the central veins in your body, your femoral or your internal jugular. We do arterial lines, which are lines that go into um, arteries and in, into your body to do constant blood pressure monitoring. We take fluid out of the chest wall, the abdominal cavity. Um, we put in dialysis catheters for emergent dialysis. And then if you do a pulmonary fellowship, um, we learn how to do bronchoscopies. So we do endobronchial ultrasounds and take biopsies of lymph nodes that surround your airway and your trachea. We do navigational bronchoscopies, which is basically utilizing a, um, it's kind of like a video game is what I like to call it. And we basically biopsy, use that video game to find nodules that are in the lungs that are far out in the periphery to biopsy that. And we take biopsies of anything that's inside the airway or just right outside of it. So it's very hands-on, it's very cerebral. So it's kind of the best of both worlds in my opinion. And this is just a picture of, the one on the left is actually a picture that my colleague sent me. Um, he's in fellowship right now. And if you look at the, the left here, can you see my mouse? Yes, I can. Okay, so if you look at the left here, this is the left main stem, this is the right main stem, and this is all a pool of blood. So these are things that we deal with um, on a daily basis. And then here, this is a patient I saw. Um, this is a tumor right here. So I took biopsies of that and it ended up being cancer. So this is kind of the hands-on approach um, that I'm talking about that is really, really neat and fun. So any questions about, about my journey? Um. Someone says, has a patient ever thrown up on you? <laughs> oh, I have had patients throw up on me. I've had them cough in my face. I've had them poop on me. I mean, you will be surprised how many different organ systems can, can fail on you. And the GI system definitely does not fail. So <laughs> it will, you will vom you will have vomit or stool at some point on you in medical school and residency. <laughs> Someone said, why did, how did you know that you wanted to do medicine? How did you decide on medicine? That's a good question. And it, it's really, a, it's a long story, but I grew up in, with a very strong um, medicine, uh, in a strong medicine household. And that was kind of all I knew. And I didn't really know anything else. And so when I started college, I made it a point to try and explore other things. I went into business, I went into finance, I went into journalism briefly. I tried to dabble in all these different things, but for some reason, my mind just kept going back to pre-med and it kept going back to medicine. And that's actually why I chose to do nutrition, um, just in case I decided that medicine wasn't for me, I could fall back and become a registered dietitian and still make a difference in people's lives. And so. I, long stories, I grew up with it and I, I didn't know any better, but I used college to experiment with different fields and make sure that medicine was something I really wanted to do. And I realized that the impact I can have on people's lives is so great and so vast, especially doing pulmonary and critical care. Someone also asked, how did you stay mentally strong during medical school and residency? I struggle with anxiety and OCD and I'm nervous to pursue medicine because of this. That's a very real, real concern. Um, I would not have made it through medical school without my, my parents and my brother and my family. Um, having a strong support system is very, very important. It doesn't necessarily have to be your family or your friends. It can be a mentor. It can be somebody that you look up to, a role model. Um, do not let your own fears and anxieties keep you from accomplishing your dreams. Anybody can be your support system. You just have to let them know that you need their help. And that is something that I think a lot of people struggle with, especially now with COVID. Anxiety is becoming much more prevalent, much more common you really need to focus on getting your dream accomplished and how you're gonna do that. And finding a support system is the first step to making sure that you can accomplish your journey. And there's multiple different ways to do that. Mm -hmm. And just one last one before we um, move on. 
How has your job changed being a pulmonary critical care physician during COVID? So we'll get into that. It's, uh, it's very busy. Um, it's very sad. It's very mentally exhausting. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, so thank you for bringing that up, but we'll definitely get into that. All right. All right. So I wanted to kind of cater the case um, to people that are getting ready to apply to medical school. Um, and I tried to stay away from a lot of the medical jargon and the pathophys. I wanted to make this more about what's pertinent to you all at this stage of your life. And so what I want to talk about is something called RHYME. And this is something that you, if you haven't heard of it, you should definitely keep in the back of your mind as you go through medical school. RHYME stands for Reporter, Interpreter, Manager, and Educator. Your job right now at this juncture is to really hone in on how to be a good reporter. So as we go through the case, you're going to see how to look at information and decipher what's important and what's not important. You're going to be, especially as a medical student, the intern and resident are going to send you into the room first to talk to the patient. You will probably be gone an hour, hour and a half. You need to decide what you gathered from that patient is important and what's not important, what will contribute to the diagnosis, what will not. And so this is the first stage that you need to hone in on and make sure that you can be good at. And then you get into being an interpreter, which is identifying the problems and prioritizing them, developing a differential manager, um, able to defend and, and develop your plan. And then an educator is someone who's kind of mastered all of these skills. So these are people that are in their last year of residency, attendings, fellows. These are people that kind of steer the team in the right direction and use evidence-based clinical practice to make sure that the patient's getting the best care. So medicine presentations are split into two different parts. You wanna have a subjective part and an objective part along with your assessment and plan. That's called a SOAP note. So the first half is a subjective. And one thing you're gonna notice when you go to medical school is that there's a ton of mnemonics. It's like alphabet soup, but you're slowly, it's slowly gonna become second nature. So when you get the chief complaint and the HPI, which is history of present illness, you wanna remember triple A OPQRST. And this is your aggravating, alleviating and associated symptoms, the onset, the precipitator, the quality, the, if there's any radiation, if that pertains, the severity and the timing. And then you always wanna get the past medical history, allergies. When you go through home medications, you not only wanna look at prescriptions that they have, but you wanna ask if they're taking any over-the-counter medications or any herbal supplements. And then social history, especially for pulmonary, is huge because if they're a smoker, that causes a lot of lung problems. If they do any illicit drugs, that causes problems. There's a lot of occupational diseases that causes lung problems. And then what type of home situation they have. Um, you should see some of the lung questionnaires that I give patients and it delves into if there's carpet in the house, if they have a purifier, a humidifier. So there's a lot of different social histories that's very important not to glaze over. And then family history and review of systems, which we'll get into. So moving on to our case, you're gonna notice that all of the information I just told you in the previous slide, being a good reporter is taking all of the information the patient tells you and putting it into a nice paragraph. So you're gonna find that everything I talked about in the previous slide is all gonna be in these few sentences. So she's a 46 year old woman with no past medical history. She comes to the emergency department with shortness of breath. She reports she's been feeling short of breath and having palpitations for the past week, but it got so bad to the point where she came to the hospital today. She says that breathing in and exertion make it worse and almost painful. Resting makes it less bothersome. Her husband was sick and he was positive for COVID and actually passed away the day prior from complications. She got tested and was negative times two, but she's been getting worse each day. She has a dry cough, subjective fevers, and has been feeling so tired and fatigued. She's also having nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And the only medication she takes is an oral contraceptive pill. She's a non-smoker, she works as a teacher, and has two healthy children who are not sick, and there's no allergies. So review of systems, this is not hers, but I kind of put the pieces of the review of systems into that HPI. But when you go into a room and talk with the patient, to make sure you don't miss anything, you wanna go through head to toe if they're having any other 
symptoms. And I'm not gonna go through this, but this is just for your edification. So I always say that medicine is like being Sherlock. When you talk to a patient, if you're in there for five minutes or 50 minutes, you wanna make sure you've gathered enough clues to find the diagnosis. So important clues that were in her history was that she was short of breath, tachypnic, she had a COVID exposure, she's on oral contraceptive pills and it hurts when she breathes in, that's pleuritic chest pain. So in our objectives, this is the second half, we're gonna look at our vitals, physical exam, labs and imaging. This is all of the information that's gonna lead you to your assessment and plan. So her oxygen saturation was 89% on six liters of nasal cannula. She was tachycardic at 110. Her blood pressure was low at 90 over 70 and her temperature was 99.9 Fahrenheit. She appears extremely uncomfortable. She's pursed lip breathing. She's tachycardic. Her lung exam was significant for diminished breath sounds and there was a long expiratory phase. So she was taking a longer time to breathe out and there was slight wheezing when she did that. On the abdomen, there was no tenderness to palpation and on her extremities, she didn't have any abnormalities. So on her labs and imaging, so we look at a complete blood count, a comprehensive metabolic panel, the mag and the FOS, and all of hers were essentially, they, they were remarkable, but not pertinent to this case. But on the top right here, you're gonna see, this is what the computer will give you. On the bottom right, this is how you want to write all your labs. So I don't know if you guys have heard of the Fishbone lab diagrams, but these are very, very important as a medical student resident and even as a fellow in attending. As soon as you look at these diagrams, you wanna be able to point out, okay, I'm looking here at the BMP on the top left, the sodium was 140, good, let's move on. And so the more you practice writing labs this way, the quicker it'll be for you to identify issues. Um, but her lactic acid was high at 4.5. So lactic acid is a marker of anaerobic metabolism. Again, bringing it back to biochem in, in med school. Um, we go through aerobic metabolism. So this patient was going through anaerobic metabolism. Her troponin and BNP were high. These are markers of uh, cardiac enzymes. And so if they're high, that means that there's some sort of damage to the heart. Her blood cultures were pending and her rapid respiratory panel was positive for COVID. So again, we have to be like Sherlock. Already, my attendings told me in medical school and residency that at the HPI, you should have 80% of the information you need to make a diagnosis. So already at this point, my mind was going towards a diagnosis for this patient. I was thinking, okay, I need to order an EKG, I need to get a chest x-ray, I need to get a CTA and an echo. And this is because I think she has a certain something which we'll get into. Based on the history that she told me, an EKG, this is not hers by the way, an EKG is gonna show specific findings. And the reason I put this up is because like everything in medicine, whenever you read an EKG, you wanna go and read it very systematically. If you do that, you will not miss this very subtle finding which is called an S1Q3T3, which is a very specific marker for something. You're gonna have a deep S wave in lead one you're gonna have a Q wave in lead three and an inverted T wave in lead three. Again, this probably does not make any sense to you, but if you systematically go through things, this will make sense to you and you will pick it up. Again, the chest X-ray um, is gonna show another clue to lead you towards a diagnosis. So in between these arrows here is something we call Westermark sign. And that basically means that there's not enough perfusion in that area. So this dark black area, there's not enough perfusion there. And Hampton's hump is a wedge-shaped infarct of the lung. So on the left here, um, we have a normal chest X-ray. On the right, we have my patient's chest X-ray. So the biggest difference you see here is that the chest X-ray on the right, it's very white and it's fluffy. And that means, so black here means air and that you're not seeing a lot of black. So you're not getting much air. This patient is not getting much air due to all of this white fluffiness that we see. The next image I wanna go over is a CTA chest. So this is imaging of the arteries and veins of the lungs. So this is a normal CTA chest. And this right here, this bright white is your pulmonary artery. This is my patient's CTA chest. So here you can see the biggest striking difference, hopefully, is that there is black here. 
there is some sort of block in the pulmonary artery. So your pulmonary artery takes deoxygenated blood from your system and puts it into the lungs to get oxygenated. It gets returned via the pulmonary veins to the left atrium and then to the left ventricle aorta to the rest of the body. So on this patient's CTA chest, there is a block. She cannot get blood from her pulmonary artery to her uh, lungs to get oxygenated. So already we see that there is a huge problem here. And just to kind of give you an idea of what we're looking at, when a patient goes through a CAT scan, they lie horizontally and go through the machine. And starting at the feet here, um, depending on what part of the body you're taking images of, you take slices of the axial slices of the patient. So we're interested in the chest here. So just picture that these axial slices are getting cut through. So when you look at this CTA chest, you're looking from the feet upwards into the lungs of the patient. So that is why your left is right and your right is left here. So I have arrows here on what we're looking at. And this right here is what we call a pulmonary embolism. So another clue um, that can lead you towards this diagnosis is an echocardiogram, and that's an ultrasound of the heart. Here we have our left ventricle, our left atrium, right atrium, and right ventricle. And this is called an apical four-chamber view. So one of the things that we learned to do in our pulmonary and critical care fellowship is how to actually perform these echocardiograms. And so on an apical four-chamber view, which is the four different chambers of the heart, I don't know if you can tell, but my patient's right ventricle was a lot bigger. And it's because blood is getting backed up from that pulmonary artery into the right ventricle. Because if you recall from anatomy and physiology, blood comes from the SVC and IVC into the right atrium, goes to the right ventricle through the pulmonary arteries, then the lungs to get oxygenated. And so we can't get to the lungs to get oxygenated. So blood is backing up into the right ventricle here. And what we call this is McConnell sign and D sign. And I'm not gonna get into the nuances and the differences between the two, but it's definitely something that's a clue that leads us towards the diagnosis. So this is the best part of, of medicine and it's forming this differential diagnosis. And it's above your scope at this time, but it's the most fun part and something that if you get really good at being that reporter, you'll be able to become very good at developing these differential diagnoses. So our problem was for this patient. She has acute respiratory distress syndrome from COVID-19, and she had a saddle pulmonary embolism, which was this right here. So latest guidelines on COVID-19. In the USA right now, there's about 8 million cases, and there's actually more than this, um, 216,000 deaths, there's, there's more. Um, the current medications that are being used right now, dexamethasone, which is a steroid, remdesivir, which is, which is actually a very old drug, and some physicians are even giving vitamin supplementation like vitamin D and vitamin C. And um, convalescent plasma, which I'm sure you've heard a lot in the media, is being used as well. And these are patients that have had COVID that have formed antibodies to it. They are donating their plasma to patients that are acutely ill. So they're essentially giving their COVID antibodies to patients to help them recover. Hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, which were first, when COVID first came out, they were first thought to be very helpful in this drug, have actually shown to be harmful, and they're currently not being used right now. On the right here, I have what the CDC panel is recommending for treatment, and most of the patients I deal with fall into the light blue and the red category. So these are hospitalized and require oxygen or they're intubated or on ECMO. And ECMO is a lung bypass machine. So these are patients that are getting steroids and remdesivir and or convalescent plasma. And I personally am checking their vitamin levels and if they're low, I'm supplementing them. So the most fatal complication of COVID-19 seems to be blood clots. Um, there's few different studies that have been put out since all of this started. Again, none of these studies are randomized control trials, which is the gold standard for how we should study a lot of different things. But because we are in an era where this is very emergent and people are dying from it, a lot of studies that have been done have just been quickly put together and the information that they've gathered is put out in the, in, for public knowledge so all of us can read into it and see how we can treat our patients. 
But the French have found that even though they're giving what we call prophylactic anticoagulation, which is just in case something happens, we're going to give them a blood thinner, people are still getting clots. Um, they found that acute respiratory distress syndrome, if they have that, their chances of having a clot are a lot higher. A Dutch study found that 184 ICU patients also had um, clots despite giving that prophylactic anticoagulation. And then another study found that 69% of those that were admitted to the ICU had clots. And then an Italian study found that the venous thromboembolic rate was 20%. So we're seeing a lot of different studies coming out that are showing that clots are actually becoming more and more commonly found in COVID patients. So I'm gonna get into management, um, specifically what we did with this patient. And also I'm gonna generalize it to what we do with all patients that come in, not only with COVID, but with what we call hypoxemic respiratory failure, which means that their lungs just aren't doing well. They're not getting enough oxygen. Um, I'm gonna talk about how we support these patients and what we do in the ICU. Um, what kind of labs we get. And always remember in the back of your mind as I'm going through this, that this is not a one man team. This is a team that takes the physician, the NP, the PA, the pharmacist, respiratory therapist, nurses, along with other specialists in endocrinology, infectious diseases, cardiology, nephrology. This is a very multidisciplinary approach. So right here, I have a video of a gentleman here. Um, I got his permission to use this. And this is pretty much the decision, the, the time that we make the decision, okay, this patient needs to be intubated. We have tried everything we possibly can. Now we need to put that breathing tube in and hook them up on a mechanical ventilator. So you can see he's abdominally breathing. And the other thing he's doing, he's got tracheal tugging, meaning he's working really hard to breathe. And you have to look a little bit closely, but you can even see that he's diaphoretic, meaning he's sweating. So with this patient, we tried oxygen, we tried OptiFlow, which gives even higher amounts of oxygen. We tried a BiPAP, which is a mask that goes on your face and allows for gas exchange. And finally, the final step is intubation and putting them on a breathing machine. So here I have a picture, or it's a very short, short video clip rather, of an intubation using a glidoscope. So a lot of patients, because you're not as close to the face with a video laryngoscope, a lot of these COVID patients are getting intubated via video laryngoscope instead of the old fashioned direct laryngoscope way. So what we do is you're, you're kind of far away from the patient and you just kind of slide the breathing tube in between the vocal cords. So you can use a lot of protection for yourself and keep a distance. Now, what you don't want to happen is a failed intubation because at that point you're thinking a crike. And a cricothyrotomy is basically cutting a hole in the neck, jabbing in a breathing tube, securing it until you can get a more permanent airway. This was, this was not our patient, thankfully, but this is a patient where if you cannot intubate them due to anaphylaxis or swelling of the airway, facial trauma, um, obesity, any, any myriad of reasons, you have to get those lungs breathing and you have to keep them alive. Your final option is to cut a hole in their throat, put in a breathing tube, secure it, and take them to the OR for them to get a more permanent airway. So in the ICU, we deal with multiple drips, multiple IV pumps, multiple medications. And one of the ways that we deal with patients that are very, very sick, that are not doing well despite all of our interventions is something called paralyzing. So it's exactly how it sounds. We put these patients on sedation and analgesia, meaning we put them on sleeping medicines and pain medications. And if they're not synchronous with the ventilator, meaning the vent settings that we set, that we think the patient will benefit from, if that patient is saying, you know what, I don't like these vent settings, I'm gonna do some, something on my own, it's more damaging to the lungs and more damaging to the patients. So we give them something called neuromuscular blocking agents, which eliminates all of the spontaneous breathing activity and it paralyzes a person and allows the machine, the ventilator machine to do 100% of the work. So it's essentially voluntary lung rest. But one thing that we as physicians and nurses and respiratory therapists need to keep in mind when we paralyze these patients is that their brain may still be awake. 
So these patients need to be deeply asleep. They need to be on good pain medication because the worst thing for these patients is to be awake and paralyzed. That just does not sound good. So that is a very fine line that we must learn to make sure that we stay on the right side of. And the nurses are very, very good about measuring that using different modalities. Another thing that we do for these COVID patients, and again, in general, for patients that are in hypoxemic respiratory failure, is proning ventilation. So basically, this is when we flip the patient on their stomach. And what this does is it allows better blood flow to the dependent lung. It reduces atelectasis, which is lung collapse. It allows secretions to drain due to gravity. And a lot of patients in America, especially, they are obese. And when they're sitting up and they're, they're sitting in the bed flat on their back, their belly is pushing up on their lungs and causing less of a lung movement. And so putting them on their stomach allows less of that abdominal distension. And again, same concept, less compression from the heart. And then it also allows the lungs to inflate at lower pressures and it allows the larger airways of the lungs to get more air entry. So what we are seeing is that proning these patients, they are doing a lot better. And one thing I want to hone in on, I know I'm you know, talking very passionately about pulmonary and critical care. I, I love what I do. I love this job, but it is not glamorous. We are wearing these suits. We are wearing two or three masks. Um, we're wearing goggles. We're wearing headgear. And you are in that room for sometimes several hours. And not only are you exposing yourself, but you're exposing your family when you go home. Um, you're sweating. It's, it's, you just, it's not fun. And a lot of, this is why you see a lot of stuff in the media about physicians getting so upset that people think COVID isn't a big deal because this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with these very, very sick patients. We're putting ourselves at risk and our families at risk. So it is not glamorous like the TV says it is. Yeah. Someone actually yeah. just asked real quick. They said, how do you, sorry, it says, how have, how do you deal with losing a patient and how do doctors deal with that type of stress? Have you lost a patient before? Very good question. Um, and I will get into that at the end, but yes, um, since COVID has started, I've probably, when I'm in the ICU, probably lose at least one or two a day. So I will, I will get into that. Um, three weeks later, my patient, this is a good story, she did improve, but now she has what we call critical illness myopathy. So just because a patient is in the ICU for two or three days, it doesn't mean that they're in the clear. These patients suffer from what we call post-ICU care syndrome or PICS, and it's basically where they're so weak from the steroids and the paralytics that we give them, their muscles atrophy. For every one day that a patient is in the ICU, they lose 10% of their lean body mass. So this is why nutrition and physical therapy are so important in the ICU. So she, unfortunately, she had just lost her husband. She has two kids that are young. She's got a long road ahead of her and will likely need 24 seven support for the next several months. Um, had we not been able to stabilize her, there are other options that some places are doing called ECMO which is basically, it stands for extracorporeal um, membranous oxygenation. And what it is, is it's a lung bypass machine. So you can do a heart lung bypass machine or just a lung bypass machine. And some facilities are doing that. Um, again, how I talked about this being a multidisciplinary approach, you need CT surgery, you need surgery, you need so many different consultants, you need so many different cooks in the kitchen to manage this disease. And it's a terrible, terrible disease, but Teamwork is especially important with these patients. So a couple of people have asked about um, having those talks with patients and the hardest part of my job. And it's really death and dying. Um, one of my attendings told me my first death that I had in, in my intern year, I got a little teary eyed in my attending and I thought I was gonna get in trouble. My attending told me, he said, you know what? Do not lose that because that means you're human. And the minute you become hard and you think that this is just another thing you have to do throughout your day, that means that you have lost all humanity. And he said that it's good you're getting teary-eyed. It's good that you're showing some emotion. Make sure you never lose that side of you. Um, 
so the hardest part, but it's probably one of the most rewarding parts of my job is talking to families and patients about their prognosis. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes I have great news to share with families, but 70% of the time I am having a conversation with families about their loved one going to die, is dying or has died. And that is probably the most mentally exhausting part of this COVID situation and being a intensivist. Um, these conversations that you have with families, it doesn't matter if you've had 10 conversations in one day, you have to make sure that the conversation you have with that family member at that time, you have to pretend it's your first conversation you've had ever. And to do this multiple times a day can become very exhausting. Um, but I always think to myself that I'm gonna be the last person that this relative remembers before they found out that their loved one was dying. So I need to make sure that I am talking to this family member like it's my own. And it's very, very hard. Um, I think the question was, have I ever lost a patient? And it doesn't matter what residency you do, you are going to lose a patient. You will experience death in some way. And how you deal with it is gonna determine how you're going, how your mental capacity and how you deal with death throughout the rest of your life is gonna be impacted. And one of the things that I wanna talk about is mental health. And if you feel like, you know, I've pronounced too many people dead today, or I've had too many conversations about death today, I need to take a day off, or I need to just, you know, take some time to myself, talk to somebody. People in medicine I have found are always willing to help each other out. This is a very teamwork oriented field. If you ever feel like you cannot have a conversation with the patient or their family, or you just need to take five minutes to yourself and go to the call room, do it because you need to take care of yourself before you have these terrible, difficult conversations with family members. Um, specifically, since COVID has started, my family discussions have become very common. I am talking to families all the time, um, every day, especially because with COVID, they're not allowed to see their, their loved ones. And so I'm calling them every day on the phone. I'm giving them updates. I'm saying, you know, your husband, your father, your brother, um, they did well today. Or your husband, your father, your brother, unfortunately, is not doing well today. We're going up on oxygen right now. And we're kind of at the last stage before we need to start having discussions about removing the ventilator. And they're hard conversations to have in person. They're harder to have over the phone, which is what we're having to do now. Um, that's, that's hard. Um, someone asked, if your patients cannot afford medicine slash surgery they need, what do you do in that situation? And if they don't take the medicine or have the surgery, they could die. So how do you deal with that? So one of the great things about critical care medicine is that the financial situation of a patient, it does not matter. We will do whatever it takes as long as it's in line with the patient's wishes to keep that patient alive. So if that patient tells me, you know, I can't afford the ventilator machine, but I want it. I say, let's put that ventilator on then. Um, the repercussions of that, I don't know. I don't know the, the medical bills that they face and, and all of that, if they make it. But if a patient tells me that they can't afford something and that's why they don't want it, to me, I tell them, if you could, if you had millions of dollars, would you want this? If they say yes, I do it. That's good. Um, going back to death and dying, someone asked, what does a doctor go through officially when they lose a patient? Do they have to do any reports or do investigations? Good question. So um, internal medicine, family medicine, critical care, obviously, I think those are probably the top three. And then surgery. Um, those are probably the top residencies where you're going to see a lot of death. And basically, when somebody dies, you have to fill out a death certificate. And this is a legal document. So. If anybody is watching that's already in residency, um, they can attest to the fact that you're gonna have to do that document over and over again, because it's very, very particular about what you need to put on there. And you fill it out and you give it to the, um, there's actually a department in the hospital that's in charge of all of the patient deaths, unfortunately. And, and you give it to them and then they proceed with the coroner, they you know make arrangements with the funeral home. And so really all you're doing is you're filling out that death certificate 
And then you're also writing a note in the chart saying that you examined the patient. So in order to declare a patient dead, you have to do reflexes, you have to listen to their lungs and their heart for a minute. If you don't hear any breath sounds or lung sounds and, and do you know that quick neurological exam, then you pronounce the patient, you write a note in the chart, you fill out the death certificate and then the rest is, is handled from there. And just to wrap it all up because we are um, running out of time, yeah. do you have any last words of advice or anything you'd like to tell students who might be considering um, Pullman Crit? You know, I, I think that this is an amazing field. Um, like I said, it's hands-on, it's very mentally stimulating. It can be exhausting, but like all fields in medicine, it, it has its ups and downs. Um, if you are thinking about doing this, feel free to, to message me. I'll be more than happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. And again, you know, the support system is a very, very big thing in medicine. If you are thinking about not even just pulmonary and critical care, but any field in medicine, find yourself a support system or a mentor that you can talk to and alleviate that stress with, because it's not something that you need to go through alone. Yeah, guys, I um, linked her Instagram account on in the comments. It's uh, Palm Crit Doc. So again, if you have any questions, just shoot her a DM and I'm pretty sure she'll try to yeah. get to as many as she can. Thank you so much for all your time and speaking. Of course, thank you for having me. A lot of people found your story very inspirational and thought that um, you taught the case study in a very uh, well way. They learned a lot. Yeah. Um, Great. So thank you again. So thank to you guys listening out there, um, make sure you guys tune in next week. We have a surgical and clinical ophthalmology PA. So if you guys are interested in that, um, make sure you guys tune in next week. And as for summaries, if you guys can write a summary and send it in to clubmedshoe at gmail.com, you guys will get a certificate verifying your shadowing hours. Again, thank you so much for your time and we will see you all next week. Bye. Bye.